Okay, guys, so your uh, textbooks do not need to be open, but your vocab notebooks should be open to um, the vocab for friend or foe. Now, the words we're adding today are not new vocab words, but we're going to be talking about um, something called literary, literary elements. So these are things authors will use. And one of them, and we'll see both of them in this story that we're reading today. So we're just adding to the notes. So draw your squiggly line and then write today's date, January 28, 2021. And then we're not numbering these because they're not vocab words. But they are, um, they are something we're going to be looking for these things today. So remember, liter I just said literary elements are things authors use to make their writing more interesting. And uh, let's see, and to add something, to make you want to read it. They also are used to make you think about what you're reading. The first one we're going to talk about is foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. F O R E S H A D O W I N G. Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is the use of clues to hint. At what is going to happen. So, when authors use foreshadowing, they give you clues that hint at what's going to happen later, not what's going to happen right then or even on the next page unless it's a short story. But foreshadowing is when an author uses clues to hint at what is gonna happen next, or what's gonna happen at the end of a story. I'm trying to think of a good, of a good example. I can't think of one right now, but we'll see it in this story. Like something that everybody knows already before we even start. I can't think of one right now, but Foreshadowing is when an author uses clues to hint at what's going to happen later. Not immediately, maybe not even till the end of the story they're writing. The other one that we're going to talk about is symbolism. Symbolism. S-Y-M-B-O-L-I-S-M. -S -S symbolism. What's the base word? in the word symbolism. Sorry. Symbol. Symbol. The word symbol, S-Y-M-B-O-L, is the base word of the word symbolism. Well, symbolism is the use of an object, like something you can touch, or feel, or see, an actual thing. We call this a concrete object. Something you can actually see, feel, touch, hold. So symbolism is the use of an object to represent qualities or ideas such as love, happiness, sadness, or courage, really any feeling. Because can we see love? Can we actually see love? Can we see love going between two people? Can we see that? 
Smith. No, we cannot see that. No, we can't. Can we see happiness? Like if someone's not smiling, but they're happy, do we actually see it like coming off of them? Like little things. Zadie? No. No. Same with sadness and courage. We can't see those feelings. Now, yeah, for happiness, we may be able to see a smile, but is the smile itself happiness? And can you smile sometimes even when you're not happy? So is a smile and happiness the same thing? Are they the same things? No. What about tears for sadness? Yeah, we know when people are sad, they may cry. But do people only cry because they're sad? No, sometimes they cry because they're happy. Sometimes they cry because they're scared. Sometimes they're actors and they're crying because they have to in this scene. Sometimes people cry to get out of trouble. So are tears and sadness the same thing? No. In stories, sometimes people, authors will use an object, an actual physical object to represent things like love or happiness. What object do you think you could use to represent love? What object, something you can hold in your hand? Kingston. A heart, like a, a piece of paper that's cut into the shape of a heart. What else? Valentine's Day is coming up. We see lots of symbolism when it comes to Valentine's Day. Erin. A rose. Zari. Chocolate. Chocolates. So that's all symbolism because can we actually see love? Can we hold love in our hands? Can we feel love with our fingers? No, where do we feel love? Michaela? In our heart. In our hearts and in our brains. Can we see that happening? No, they're inside our bodies. What about sadness? What physical object that you can hold and you can actually see it exists can you use to represent sadness? Zari. Maybe like a little thing that you make, like maybe something you made or have that makes like that you hold. Well, okay, you just told me an object. What object? Tell me an object that we could use to represent sadness or something that you've seen represent sadness. Victoria. A broken heart, okay? What else? Smith? A piece of paper with a sad face drawn on it. A sad face? A piece of paper with a sad face drawn on it? A lamp. A what? I can't hear you. Blue. Blue? The color blue? Okay. What about happiness? What could we use? What symbol? What actual thing? Can we use to represent happiness? Come on guys, you gotta think more about just love and happiness. Erin. We could draw a picture of a smiley face. A smiley face? Carla? A stuffed animal that is smiling. A stuffed animal that's smiling. Okay, let's get away from the smiles because we've said smiles. Kingston? Yellow. Yellow, the color yellow. Sorry. I'm a heart. That would be more for love. And we already said that as a symbol. Victoria? Sunshine. Sunshine. Smith? Something that makes you happy. Okay, well, yes, but we would want to use specific examples because symbols are actual objects. So we have to think of actual objects. What about courage? What could we use to symbolize courage? Courage. Sorry? Maybe like a necklace that you got that gave you perfect courage. Okay, hey, you're you're naming things that we can use to give us courage. We're not thinking of things that make us feel brave. We're thinking of like if you were trying to show that your character was courageous, you're drawing a picture, and you're trying to show that your character has courage, what would you give? What would you draw? Kingston. Okay. Okay. 
Victoria? A sword? Zadie? I would draw myself like maybe on a tall zip line. Okay, so like maybe high up. Zari? Army. What? Like armor. Armor? Okay. Uh, Carla? A wizard staff. A wizard staff. Okay, like a staff. Aaron? Okay, a picture of somebody saving people. Okay, so what we're doing as we read today is we're looking for foreshadowing. We're looking for clues that tell us what's gonna happen next. The author's not actually gonna say this means this, but we're looking for clues that hint at what's gonna happen next. Then we're also gonna look for symbols, for symbolism. We're gonna look for actual objects that mean something other than what that object is, like a heart doesn't mean love. It doesn't mean love. We can draw a heart even if on the saddest days of our lives, if we like love no one. We can put a smile does not mean happiness. We can put a smile on when all we want to do is cry. Tears don't mean sadness because I may be so happy that I start crying. So what we're looking for is we're looking for actual objects that people can see, feel, touch, smell, whatever that represents something else. So let's go ahead and look at, open your book to page 298. Can I put these nope, leave your book, have notebooks out because you might need to look at this. And then when you get your independent practice, you will definitely need your notes. We're on page 298. And please read the genre, Cullen, loud and slow. Genre. Trickster tales are folk tales mostly about animals in which one character tries to trick another. Often the tricker ends up looking foolish. Who can think of a folk tale that's a trickster tale? One where someone tries to trick someone else and then ends up looking foolish. Can, Mason? Um, there's the one with the, the tortoise and the hare. How is that a trickster tale? Um, that is a folk tale, but is it a trickster? Does rabbit try to trick tortoise? No, he just thinks. So it's close. It is a folk tale. But it's not quite a trickster tale because rabbit or the hare never actually tries to trick the tortoise. He just thinks, oh, I have no problems. I'm going to win. He does end up looking foolish for sure. But, and we end up learning a lesson, but he's not trying to trick anybody. Zadie? Um, it's not, not, not a lot of people know this one, but it's the tortoise and the hawk. Okay, how does that one go? It's where the tortoise sees all the hawk flying and he wants to fly. And so he said he'll give the um, hawk half his bull if he teaches him how to fly. And then once the tortoise gets up in the air with the hawk, the hawk just drops him. Okay. Close, but no one's trying to trick anybody. So that's kind of like... Um, I was thinking at first, I was like, oh, the blank, but because even I was thinking of stuff and I was like, wait, but nobody actually tries to trick anybody. The one about the, um, I think it's like the alligator and the frog. And the frog asked the alligator to take him across the river. And the alligator says, sure, I'll take you across the river. And then halfway across the river, the, the alligator eats the frog. So that's like that story where nobody's actually trying to trick anybody. It's just teaching us, it, we do learn a lesson, but we're learning not to trust everybody that comes along. But nobody's actually trying to trick anybody. Scorpion and the frog. I think that's the same thing. Where the um, well, what is the story? Because I'm remembering part of it. The scorpion asked the frog. It. The scorpion asked the frog. Asked the frog to help him get to like 
That's like the, the alligator and the frog. So like, to get, and then, mm -hmm. and then the scorpion stings the frog. And then says, what do you expect? I'm a scorpion. That's not quite a trickster and, tale either. And, and also the, um, oh yeah, and also the scorpion dies with the frog. That is true. That is true. So kind of, except nobody's really trying to trick. Aaron, did you have one? I have one example that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. Okay, but nobody's trying to trick. So the story I'm thinking of is, um, who's heard Br'er Rabbit, the Br'er Rabbit stories? And there's Br'er Rabbit and he finds this, um, the, he does this thing, there's the tar baby, Br'er Rabbit and the tar baby. It was a big story, I remember, well it wasn't big when I was little, it's big, big for hundreds and hundreds of years. But what happened, let me see if I can find the exact story. can't okay I can't find it but there's a story Br'er Rabbit has this tar baby I think I'm thinking of I'm combining stories in my head I had a story but I can't remember what it was so trickster tales are when somebody is trying to trick somebody else not necessarily like um, the tortoise and the hare where he thinks he can win and then he ends up looking foolish that's similar to a trickster tale but a trickster tale is where someone is trying to trick someone else but then ends up looking foolish so now we can definitely, we have an example right here that we're going to read. So, Colin, please read the title and the author. Flycracker and... Not Flycracker. Flycatcher and Coyote by Gillen Reed. Usually Jillian. Smith, read next. Many years ago, Flycatcher visited a lake whose water was a spectacular shade spectacular. of blue. Spectacular. Many years ago, Flycatcher visited a lake whose water was, spectac was a spectacular shade of blue. At that time, Flycatcher's feathers were dull, gray, and ugly, and so the bird loved to look at the beautiful blue water. Coyote hid nearby to watch Flycatcher. Okay. Mason, please read next, loud and slow. Not bath, there's an E at the end. So how do you think you say that? TH together makes one sound. So we know if we have a vowel and then one letter or sound and then an E, what happens to that vowel? Hmm? So listen, you're, you're just staring at the word, not thinking. Let your brain, clear your brain. Now listen to what I'm saying. Don't stare at the book because then you're just looking at the word over and over again. Look at me. When we have an E at the end of a word, there's one letter or sound right before it and then a vowel before that. What happens to that vowel sound? What does the E at the end do to that vowel sound? It makes it what? Long. So we have A, T-H, which is one sound, E. So how would we say that? We have B, long A, T-H, 
silent E. How would we say that? Not fast. Not fast. A is short A. We know that E at the end is going to make that a long A. What is, how does, what does long A sound like, Mason? A. A. Your, stop, stop with the hand. So B, long A, T, H. How would you say that? Not bad. That's short A. B, A. B, A. Who can help him out? Kingston. Can't hear you. Ethan, louder. Bathe. B, long A, T, H would sound like bathe. But Mason, is bathe a word? What is a word? Not bath. Not bath. We wouldn't say bathe. How would we say it? Bathe. bathe. So read that sentence again with confidence, please. Flycatcher loved. Louder. I'm sorry, Mason. Michaela, can you please reread that paragraph so that I can't hear you from here? So that means they definitely cannot hear you. Michaela, can you please reread that paragraph so that we can hear? Flycatcher loves the blue of the lake so much that he swoops down. Not he. Down. Not he. Much that she swooped down from the tree to bathe in the lake. She did it. She did this four times every morning. And four days in a row. Not and four days. Or four days in a row. Each time the bird bathed in the water, in the water, she sang this song. Lovely lake, so pretty and blue. Not, not pretty. So pure and blue. Pure. Remember, e at the end makes that a long u sound, so it's not purr. Lovely lake, so purr and blue. You just said it's not purr. The E at the end makes it a long U. What does long U sound like? U. Okay. So how would you say that word? P, U, R. Purr. Not purr. P, U, R. U, R. Pure. There you go. Lovely lake, so pure, 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 pure. Not purr. You keep saying purr. You got it, but then you keep saying purr. Purr is P E R or P U R R. You said the word. You said pure. But then when you went to go back and read it, you said purr again. We have to read it the correct way, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Lovely lake, so pure. There you go. Let me dip myself so I'll be blue too. Okay, so in these first two characters, uh, look. First two paragraphs, we hear about two characters. Who are the two characters that we've heard about so far? Zari. Coyote. Coyote. And um, bird, I mean um, flycatcher. Flycatcher. Now, what do we know about flycatcher? What do we know about flycatcher? Aaron. She loves the color blue. She loves it. What do we know about Coyote? Smith? Coyote 
Coyote loves Flycatcher. Do we know a that? Sea Flycatcher. Do we know that? What do we know about Coyote? Does it say that Coyote loves Flycatcher? Zadie? No. So what do we know about Coyote? That, that he hid nearby to watch Flycatcher. So do we really know anything about Coyote? Why do you think Coyote was mentioned then if we don't know anything about him other than that he's hiding nearby? Victoria. Okay. Does it say that in the story? No. So what is that? You thinking, hmm, Coyote's mentioned, but we don't know anything about him. Maybe he's going to eat Flycatcher. What is that? Um, what is that? We see Coyote mentioned. We don't know anything about Coyote. But yet we already have a little idea that Coyote may try to eat Flycatcher. What is that? Cullen? An inference. Okay, an inference, but it's something specific. Why did we make that inference? What was the author doing so that we would make that specific inference? Carla? It was shadowing the clue. To foreshadowing. It's not, shadow, it's not shadowing the clue. This is the clue. The foreshadowing is the clue. So it's foreshadowing what? Saying that Coyote is hiding and watching Flycatcher is foreshadowing what, Carla? It's, it's foreshadowing that the, maybe at the end or near the end, the Coyote may eat the Flycatcher. Very good. So when characters are kind of mentioned out of the blue, and then we don't really hear about them again right away, that could be foreshadowing. If you're reading a story, and all of a sudden they mention a character, and then you read the next paragraph, and that character's not mentioned again, go back and read what's happening with that character. What is happening with Coyote here? What is happening with Coyote? Come on guys, you all have the book. If it's just the same people that it keep trying, this is not gonna be a good rest of the year. What is happening with Coyote? Kingston. How do we know that? What is happening? What do we know is happening? We're not making inferences. What do we know is happening with Coyote right now? Coyote hiding. He's hiding. Watching, watching Flycatcher. Fly That's what we know, and then we don't hear about him. So the fact that he's hiding, is he up to good things? Ethan, no. how do we know that he's not up to something good. Okay, why does him hiding mean he's not up, he's up to no good? It seems suspicious. Do we hide when we're doing good things? Not usually. The fact that he's hiding to watch Flycatcher makes it sound like he's up to no good. It's foreshadowing that maybe Coyote is gonna do something to Flycatcher. Okay, Victoria, read next. On the fifth morning, that flycatcher went bathing. Something amazing happened. When she flew out of the water, her feathers had become a drizzling. Not blue. drizzling. So did she get her, did she, her goal, did it happen? What was her goal? Colin? Um, she 
Colin? To get her like the blue of the lake. So to turn blue and it looks like it happened. Okay, I will read next. Everybody should be following along with their finger even if they're, it's not their turn to read so that when it is your turn to read, you know exactly where we are. Yes, Ari, quickly. On the page, on the other page, it has like a little caption. I know, but we already talked about it. This whole time, Coyote had been watching the bird. Uh-oh, here's Coyote again. We know Coyote hiding and watching Flycatcher was foreshadowing that maybe Coyote's gonna do something not so good. Let's find out. Coyote didn't admire the bird or want to learn more about her. No, Coyote was trying to think of a way to trick the bird and eat her. But Coyote was afraid of the water and could never get close enough to Flycatcher. So was, was our inference based on that foreshadowing correct? Is he up to no good? Is he hiding so that he can try to catch her? Kingston, read next, loudly. Loudly. Oh, you're not ready. Aaron. Okay, we'll get ready. Instead of just sitting there, because now if I call you again, like what if I put your stick back and then called you immediately again? Aaron, go ahead. On the day the flycatcher turned blue, Coyote was so impressed that he forgot all about catching. He called up the flycatcher who was perched safely in a tree. How did your ugly gray feathers turn that wonderful blue? Tell me how you did it so, so I can be blue too. Okay. Read next. Sorry, loud and slow. Yes, Smith. Sorry, just go ahead. Flycatcher was so happy that she was feeling gorgeous. Not gorgeous. You read, see what you did? You saw the first letter and then the last three letters and you guessed, your brain guessed gorgeous. But you have to let your eyes read the whole word before your brain can say what it is. So try again. Flycatcher was so happy that she was feeling generous. She remained safely on her branch, but she told Coyote, this is what you must do. Jump in the lake four times every morning for four mornings. Then jump in the lake on the fifth morning and you will turn blue. You might try to sing my song too. Flycatcher taught Coyote her song and then flew murmurly. Not murmur, there's no extra M. Merrily. Merrily, good. So close. Merrily. On her way. Do you think Coyote will turn blue? Do you think Coyote will turn blue? Michaela? No. No? Why? Because she's trying and it's not working. But it did work. Flycatcher did oh. turn blue and we, we haven't seen Coyote try yet. Colin? No, because he said earlier that he didn't like the water. Okay. So why does that make you think he's not gonna turn blue? Because he he's not gonna get in the water. And what has to happen in order for him to turn blue? Get in the water. Hmm, good, I hadn't even thought about that. That was a really good use of foreshadowing and making an inference because it said earlier he didn't like the water. Have we heard anything about that since? But now Flycatcher is telling him, you better get in the water if you wanna turn blue. And so Cullen said she does not think that he's gonna turn blue. 
because she says he said he didn't like to get in the water. So that's foreshadowing that he's not going to get in. Good. I didn't even think of that one. Kingston, do you have another answer? I can't hear you. Are you sure? We haven't turned the page yet, so I don't know why you're on the next page. I mean, now we're ready to turn the page, but we weren't yet. We were still talking about this page. Okay, read next, Carla. Well, Coyote was really wanting to be blue. So, even though he hated the water, he jumped into the lake four times the next morning. Okay, so Colin, your prediction wasn't correct, but were you wrong? No. Why weren't you wrong? Why was Cullen not wrong? I mean, her prediction was incorrect, but why was Cullen and her thinking not incorrect? Zari. Because we hadn't flipped the page yet. We hadn't read it yet, so we didn't know. Good, so that's one reason. We didn't know, we hadn't flipped the page yet. There's another reason that even though her prediction was incorrect, Cullen and her thinking was not incorrect. Zadie. I think she wasn't correct because um, he... She, she was, was correct. Why was her thinking correct? Because um, he really didn't like, he did, really didn't want to get in the water. So, because you used what, even though your prediction didn't come true, you were still correct. What did you use to get, to help you make your prediction? What am I telling you guys to use all the time when you answer questions? Oh, the hook. Which is called what? What is that called? Smith, what is that called? Context clues. Well, yes. But what do I always say? We had it a lot in wonder. If you answer a question, you need to use... Michaela? You need to make entrance. Miss Miller? Yes, but there's a word. There's something. That's what we're doing. But what do we use to make inferences? Is it we use on? what? Ms. Yes. Collins. Yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Let's see. What am I always telling you to use? Zari? Text evidence. Text evidence. If you use text evidence to make a prediction over something we have not read yet, even if your prediction doesn't come true, you use text evidence, you use details from the story, so you are thinking along the right path. So yes, Cullen, when we make inferences, if our inference is incorrect, do we feel bad about it and say, ugh? No, because as long as you read the details and you use text evidence, anything could happen. I didn't write the story, you didn't write the story, maybe you would have gone in a different direction. Okay, um, yes, Smith, do you have a question? Um, I don't know if it was just me, but like a few minutes ago, every single one of you was freezing and glitching a lot. Okay, I think it was just you because you were freezing a little bit, but remember, okay. remember there's really nothing I can do about it, so all you have to do is just wait for it to come back. We don't have to stop the lesson to talk about it. Just wait for us to come back, okay? If it keeps happening, watch the video that night. Okay? If it keeps happening to the point where you can't get, you don't understand what I'm saying, you can chat me, you can send me a quick chat and let me know, and then watch the video that night. Okay, yes, Zadie, quickly. Um, and before we saw this page, I, I, I thought like he would get in the water, but he either wouldn't like it or he wouldn't turn blue. Okay. Okay. Read next, Ethan, loud and slow. He, he sang the bird song, and he shivered as he sang. He did this for four days. On the fifth morning, Coyote emerged from his lake bath with lovely, with lovely blue fur. Coyote whistled to himself, I'm blue and beautiful. Good. Okay, read next, Zadie. Coyote couldn't 
couldn't wait to show off his new collar. He thought his fine blue fur would make him the envy of all the desert creatures. He strolled along looking left and right for someone to admire him. Coyote walked for four hours, but he didn't find, he didn't find any admirers. He grew impatient. Then Coyote remembered a canyon where many animals and people lived. They would notice him, but he would have to hurry to reach the canyon before sundown. So right now, we have a problem. What's Coyote's problem? What is Coyote's problem here? Aaron? He can't find any people to admire him. He can't find anybody to admire him. He's turned blue. He's so excited, but he can't find anyone to admire him. What is he doing to try to solve the problem? What's he doing right now to try to solve the problem? Ethan? He's trying to go to the canyon. Why is he trying to go to the canyon? So people can admire him. See his beautiful color. Why is he going to the canyon? Um, well, why did he choose the canyon? Why did he choose the canyon to go to? There's a lot of desert animals there. Very good. Let's find out if he, if that did solve his problem. Michaela, read next. A coyote ran. He noticed that that late afternoon, shadows around him. He wondered if his shadow was a, as blue as he was. He twisted his blue head around to take a look. Coyote got a good look at his shadow, which was not blue but he failed to see the big boulder ish. Cover up, L-Y. What is that word? Direct. Okay, now add the L-Y sound to the end and what do you get? Directly. There you go. So uh, start that sentence again, but he failed. But he failed to see the big boulder directly ahead of him. Coyote ran smack, smack into the boulder and fell to the ground. Okay, so we just read about how Coyote comes across a boulder. What happens? Zadie. He was too busy watching his shadow, so he ran into the boulder. He ran into the boulder. What do you think that boulder symbolizes? Not what is it? It's a boulder. It's a giant rock. What does it symbolize? So think about what that object, that big giant boulder, that giant rock, what does it represent? Victoria. Does that make sense with the, what's happening? Think a little deeper. Sometimes we see rocks and we see them as representing strength, but that would mean that the character would be strong. But what do you think this represents for Coyote? This big boulder. What is it symbolizing for Coyote? Aaron. Can't hear you. Oh, no, you're reading. We haven't even gotten there yet. Do you see where it's pointing? And does that have anything to do with a, a rock, a giant boulder? Nope. Zari, what do you think that giant boulder represents or symbolizes for Coyote? I think it represents that he's just trying to show it off. He doesn't really, he isn't even trying to, like, thank the, the um, sky catcher for, um, telling him everything he needed to do. Okay. How does the rock, how does the big boulder symbolize that? What does the big boulder have to do with that? 
Kingston? Staying blue? You use the word block. Like keep him from staying blue. Do you think it's gonna keep him from staying blue? Do you think it's gonna change his color just running into the rock? What do you think it might block him from doing? Well, what do you think it does represent? Blocking him from what? Colin? The canyon. So, from what? The end. Okay. From what? Why is he going to the canyon? Oh, to show. It's literally blocking his way to the canyon. So that is symbolizing what? Smith? It symbolizes that he um, should not show everyone his new color. He should just feel how he is. Okay. Okay. Keep reading. Zadie. over and over in the dirt. His blue legs flying when, when he finally stopped and stood up. Coyote was the color of the dusty desert, desert earth. A little slower. Coyote shook himself, but the dusty color stayed on him. To this day, all coyotes are the color of the, du of the dusty desert. And to this day, because her intentions were pure, the fly catcher is the color of the of the beautiful blue lake. Okay, so let's think about that. We have a little more symbolism here. Coyote was blue, and he was trying to go show off, and what happened? Because he was in such a hurry to go show off, and he was so worried about what he looked like, what happened? Aaron? He, he ran into a boulder and got his color back. Well, he ran into a boulder. Did he just change back? What caused him to change colors? He fell and he rolled across the dirt, which made him lose that blue color. Because it was, why did he lose the blue color? Did the blue come off of him? Cullen? No. No, what happened? Why did he lose that color? Because all the, uh, the dirt got onto him and wolves are normally dirt well, this is a coyote, not a wolf. Uh, uh, coyotes are normally uh, like dirt kind of color. They are kind of dirt color. Not quite brown, not quite gray, but kind of a mixture. So he got the dirt all over him and up in his fur. Think about if you have a dog and he rolls around in the dirt. Does it just get on top of his fur? No, it gets like all inside and then you have to give him a bath sometimes. It's so bad. But Flycatcher stayed blue. Why did Flycatcher stay blue? So Coyote was so busy trying to show off that he ran into a rock and rolled around in the dirt because he fell. He hit the rock and that sent him flying, rolling around in the dirt, and he turned that dusty, dirty, gray-brown color. Why did Flycatcher stay blue? Like, why did Flycatcher literally stay blue? Zadie. Because it, her intentions were... Okay, well that's what it says, but in li literally. Why did she say blue? Because she didn't, like, she wasn't in a rush to, like, show off her. So what did she not do because she wasn't in a rush? Colin? She didn't hit a... She didn't get dirty. She wasn't in a rush to show anybody, so she didn't get dirty, whereas Coyote was. So, what does that dull, ugly color represent? What, is, what does it symbolize? Without reading the book. What does it symbolize? Zari. Like his, like, how he's acting, like. Is it how he's acting? Carla? How he's trying. <laughs> Carla? Oh, his hurt. The dull, dusty color of his fur is a symbol of the hurt pride. So how do you feel when you bump into something and everybody sees? How do you feel when you trip and fall in front of everybody? Smith. 
Embarrassed. Embarrassed. So how do you think he feels now after falling, after running into the rock and rolling all over the place because he fell? He was going so fast, he like bounced off of it and rolled in the dirt. How's he feeling now? Same four people. Think. Victoria. So he's embarrassed. Think about the color of dust. Is that a very pretty color? So now it symbolizes that color, that dusty color is symbolism for Coyote's hurt pride. He's no longer beautiful. Like Flycatcher, who wasn't in a rush and didn't make a mistake and get dirty and lose her blue color because she just wanted to be blue, to be blue, not to show off. So now that dusty brownish gray color that coyotes are symbolizes their hurt pride, their embarrassment. The fact that they couldn't slow down and just enjoy the color. They only wanted that color to show off. Okay, read the last little bit. Victoria, loud and slow. So now Coyote has nothing to show off. Why does Coyote have nothing to show off? What's the lesson that we learned here? Because remember, folk tales, no matter what, whether they're trickster tales or something else, they always teach us a lesson. What is the lesson we learn here? Zadie. That um, don't be like in a rush. Just enjoy what, what, whatever it is that you have. Don't be in a rush to show off. Enjoy it. Do your best. Take your time. Don't be in a rush because if you're in a rush, you end up feeling how? Aaron? Embarrassed. Embarrassed. You end up making a mistake like Cody, like Coyote did when he ran into the boulder and got all dirty and then ended up embarrassed. Okay, girls at home, go ahead and get out your end. Everybody should be looking at this sheet right here. It says foreshadowing and symbolism at the top, and it has page 79 down at the bottom. What should you always do with these boxes at the top? Mason, as long as you read this, what do you not have to bring home with you tonight? Your vocab, because you have it right here. So what you're going to do is you're going to read each passage, then on the blank line, indicate whether the passage had any examples of symbolism or foreshadowing. Then explain your answer. I'll give you a hint. There's one of each. One shows foreshadowing, one shows symbolism. So you have to figure out which one is which. Not only are you writing the word foreshadowing or symbolism, you're telling why you think that. Okay? So if the passage shows foreshadowing, what is the foreshadowing? Like in this story, we knew that Coyote hiding and watching Flycatcher was foreshadowing that he was going to try to eat her, catch her. Which we know is true because it later said Coyote was trying to think of a way to trick Flycatcher into coming out so he could eat her. I mean, he got distracted in that trick, but that was his plan. So if you choose foreshadowing, what is happening that foreshadows what? So this would be an example for this story. Foreshadowing. Coyote is hiding because he wants to eat flycatcher. So that is what your answer should look like. You should have the word and then a complete sentence that tells why you think that. If it's symbolism, you say symbolism. Coyote is a dusty color 
because that symbolizes embarrassment or something like that, okay? So you have the word, which one is it? And then a complete sentence saying why you think that. Any questions about the homework? Okay, everybody, go ahead and put that in take home in return to school. Then clear your desks of everything except for your planner. Can we leave our